Hello, my name is Julie Hayes and I'm one of the researchers for the Primary English Teaching Association of Australia called PETA and this is Louise Kelly and Michael Canavan, two teachers who've been involved in our research. And I was the principal at Cowandella Primary School for 17 years, so we know each other well. We'll be talking about uh, the research underpinning one of the units of work in this book called Teaching the Language of Climate Change Science that I co-authored with uh, Dr. Bronwyn Parkin. Now, Louise and, and Michael have worked with uh, Bron Parkin for, uh, well, as long as they've been teaching, really. And as she's been a consultant here, teaching us about scaffolding pedagogy that really supports students from disadvantaged backgrounds. And uh, she's worked with the teachers here and with Dr. Helen Harper and other teachers across Australia to refine that pedagogy, you know, year after year after year. And Louise and Michael have been an integral part of that. So how did we get to uh, doing this collaborative research on climate change? In 2016 and 17, Helen Harper and Bronwyn Parkin won a PETA research grant to look into how to teach academic language to marginalised students. Two schools were chosen, one in the Northern Territory and they focused on maths, but here in South Australia, Louise and Michael's class were used uh, as uh, trialling uh, the pedagogy to teach science more effectively. They wanted to investigate ways that we could use l foreground language so that students were able to, to write and to talk about science in extended cohesive text, so long explanations, rather than just filling in a, in a close exercise or one word answers. We wanted our students to be able to uh, use extended texts and explanations and arguments and reports around, in this case, it was a topic of um, lunar eclipse. So out of that uh, research with uh, Brom Park and Helen Harper and Michael came Teaching with Intent, this Peter publication called Scaffolding An Language with Marginalised Students. Um, and then because uh, Helen Harper and Bron Parkin had been working with, with teachers all over Australia, refining the scaffolding pedagogy, which in South Australia was called Accelerated, accelerated Literacy. They needed to record that so that they, that could be shared with other teachers across the, the country. So they wrote uh, the next text called Teaching with Intent, Literature-Based uh, Literacy Teaching and Learning. So that's teaching English and literacy skills in, in the subject area literacy using literature. And again, Louise and Michael's work is featured in that book. So uh, I'm telling you this so that you know that the uh, two researchers, Brom Parkin and myself, have worked for a long time with Michael and Louise and uh, we know each other well. Louise and Michael were asked to join this next project on climate change. Bronwyn and I uh, were both interested in climate change and when we realised that climate change is not in the science curriculum until year 10, we knew that we needed to do something to help teachers to work out which bits of science actually relate to climate change. So we looked through all the substrands of science and we picked out those bits and uh, put them in a progression and then linked that to the cross-curriculum priority of sustainability. I mean, that took quite a bit of work because we worked with uh, science teachers, the Science Teachers Associations and lots of academics. So what we were trying to do was save teachers that work and make it uh, possible for them to look at a strategic approach to teaching about climate change from preschool right through to year eight. So we invited uh, Louise and Michael to be part of that research to actually flesh out the continuum form, the uh, structure of this book, but we needed units of work to tell teachers you know, how they could possibly approach each topic. So Louise and Michael looked at the year five, six science topic of um, states of matter and properties of solids, liquids and gases. So that led us really neatly to looking at the greenhouse effect and the enhanced greenhouse effect. Now, we know that mastering academic disciplines depends largely on mastering the, the language of those academic disciplines. For example, science concepts don't exist in the ether. They are developed through language, they are understood through language, and as students move through and sort of learn more about the, the issues around climate change, those understandings and concepts are developed and refined. And indeed, they are often assessed through the use of language. So our approach was to try and help students use the technical language in extended explanations and reports. Um, and so the next step 
for us, the, the two researchers and Louise and Michael, was to bring all of these years of learning together and to work out the best way to approach this topic of teaching about the greenhouse effect with our senior students. Uh, but before we go into exactly what they did, I'll ask Michael just to tell us a little bit about the school and the class. Thank you, Julie. Cowandilla is a vibrant multicultural community about 10 minutes um, from the city of Adelaide. We're a welcoming inner city school and children's centre and we serve children from birth to year seven. So we are culturally and linguistically diverse with 64% of our students coming from a non-English speaking background. Um, our year six, seven classes had 51% of students having an English as an additional language or dialect background. And our classes had 48 students across our two combined classes and we use our shared learning space for flexible learning groups. Louise, can you tell us about what teaching the language of climate science actually involved? Like, what did you do? Yeah, thanks, Julie. So, like Julie spoke about earlier, we started with the Australian curriculum because that has to be the foundation of, of whatever we teach. Um, and as she mentioned, that solids, liquids and gases tied in really well to climate change, to then the greenhouse effect and the enhanced greenhouse effect. And as she's mentioned, you know, overall with these units of work and with ours in particular, the aim was for students to have an uninterrupted turn so that they could engage in that academic language and show mastery of that, of that explanation text. Um, and that's both orally and in a written form as well. So covering both the greenhouse effect and the enhanced greenhouse effect. And the idea is that we're emerging them in the literacy of science and that they show that that understanding through the use of their language and when we met with um, Julie and Dr Bronwyn Parkin and we collaboratively developed a focus text that became the core of our unit and essentially it replaces that idea of a unit of work it is your unit of work um, and linking in with the climate change pr progression that Julie mentioned so in constructing that focus text all of the planning all of the things you would normally put into a unit are all embedded within the language and it becomes a really cohesive text to cover everything that you need, including the science content, as well as the literacy and I guess the English skills that we want as students mm. to be using. And, and most importantly, when it comes to science, that we had references and credible sources of reputable um, scientific information, and that was really key. Um, so then within that focus text, uh, we were then able to see what learning activities were, were relevant and were needed and the focus text determined what those were um, and that was both to cover the understanding and also the engagement. Sometimes scientific topics can be very abstract and it's, you can't exactly get a hands-on version easily so it was about um, connecting that with for the students and also to support the need for them to be constantly using scientific language. So that covered notes, visuals, demonstrations, interactive things that, that we found, videos and models and things like that. And of course, the text. So the importance of this focus text can't be underestimated. And yeah. um, particularly in our context, as Michael mentioned, <coughs> we've got high numbers of students with um, diverse language needs as well as diverse learning needs. So nothing can be assumed or expected coming into a unit and just because they're year six and seven doesn't mean they have mastery of the reception through to year five content. And we had to make sure that everyone had access to all of that prior understanding that would normally be assumed we needed to make that all explicit. Um, and that's that big part of, of this sort of pedagogy that we've been working, as Julie mentioned, for you know, over a decade, um, that there has to be a common understanding. And that's how you are ensuring that all of your students, regardless of their, their learning background, are coming into the learning with the equal opportunity of being successful and having mastery of that language. Um, and from a, a teachery point of view, we had pre and post assessments so that we could um, see do a comparison of what did they know before and what have they learned at the end of the unit and and of course as being part of a project our lessons were filmed and then we met and debriefed at the end of every day um, tweaked things worked on what the research was telling us we needed to do for those next lessons um, to, to cover that key content and that key language. Michael can you tell us a little bit more in more detail about the pedagogies you used in this research? So underpinning the pedagogy, there's sort of two, two main um, big picture ideas and that's about the focus text that Louise was um, referring to and that's that the focus text provides both the science content and the language that needed for students to become participants in the scientific discourse. The other core concept being that we're moving from everyday concrete language to technical abstract language. Um, 
going into now some of the um, more specific um, strategies that we would use within the lessons um, and I'll try to give uh, an example of how we used it or of what the strategy was, how we used it and why they were important to use. So the, one, the, f the first strategy I'll mention is one that we call power up, power down. And that's connecting a common sense understanding of a concept with a scientific term. So what we do is we shift from common sense language to technical language, powering up, and back to everyday language, powering down. And doing this helps students build strong connections between concepts and their meaning. At the beginning of a unit, we like to use or we tend to use more everyday language to introduce the more technical language that we're planning to introduce throughout the, throughout the unit of work. And over time and as we get to the end of a unit, we're wanting to see students using that technical language or having them power up and explaining the concepts um, using the language that we've introduced. Yeah. So an example would be um, with the uh, topic that we studied, the greenhouse effect, we wanted them to understand about solar radiation being reflected from the Earth's atmosphere. When we introduced the term using a diagram that's in the, um, the language of climate science text that um, Julie showed at the beginning of the, um, the video, um, uh, there was an arrow in a diagram showing solar radiation being reflected. When we first introduced that, we talked to the students about here, you can see in this diagram, solar radiation bouncing off the Earth's atmosphere. So bouncing off that language, common sense every day, not overly technical to help the students understand solar radiation bouncing off the Earth's atmosphere. As we move through the unit and we develop the, the understanding, we get the students to then begin using the term being reflected yeah. or reflection. So that's the idea of power up, power down. And the constant shift between those two terms, bouncing off, being reflected, is giving the students the understanding of connecting the concept and the, the language yeah. to that concept. Um, so next, another strategy that we would use or another pedagogy that we use is about maintaining positive effect. This strategy is aiming to keep students' attitudes positive when they offer responses. And this is crucial in the scientific discourse with our students, um, with, with all classes, um, but particularly for students from marginalised backgrounds who, like Louise was talking about earlier and as um, Julie was mentioning, with um, a lot the purpose of this um, research to help students from marginalised backgrounds. And it's about, like I mentioned, maintaining positive effect, particularly when um, students' responses are incomplete or if they demonstrate some misunderstanding. Uh, so the aim here is to avoid dismissing or rejecting students' responses, um, and, but, but to affirm their contribution. And we want to then reframe their contribution using our knowledge of the student, the topic, the class, so that we continue with the learning discussion. Now this can be challenging because our, our default response especially when we're um, in, a, in a topic where there is a, a correct answer, is to, to basically get the student's response, say, no, that's not correct, and ask another student for the correct answer. So an example would be teacher asking the class, what does the greenhouse effect do? The st a student might respond, it cools the earth. And I would say, no, move on, ask the question to another student. I'd like to offer a different way of responding. So I'd be saying to the student that you're right that it impacts on the Earth's temperature, although it doesn't cool it. We could then further ask, can anyone explain how greenhouse gases control the Earth's temperature? By reframing the student's response in this way, we've affirmed their contribution, we've continued the discussion in an appropriate way, and we're now moving on to uh, get the appropriate knowledge spoken about in the classroom and continue the learning discussion appropriately. The aim here with this 
uh, pedagogy is to keep the students engaged in the lesson to keep that student but all students. We've invited the community of students to continue the learning. We've reduced any feeling of marginalisation yeah. from the scientific discourse from that uh, initial student. And what the aim is, is to, of course, enga engage all students, but to prevent that initial student from not wanting to make further contributions in, in lessons in the future. That's so another strategy that we use is the very specific use of questioning and the handover of long terms of talking and the use of language through our questioning. Yeah. We adjust and modify questions really deliberately as, as we uh, move through a topic and we use questioning to revise learning and to hand over the technical language in a very gradual way. At the earlier stage of a unit, we do more telling about the topic and about particular language and we would expect less detail in students' responses. As the students gain more confidence and control of the language throughout the unit, our questions then expect more from them and they elicit more detailed responses. Because we have been so careful in our language choices, as we've discussed uh, ab about our use of the focus text and language choices with, the, with our topic, our handover of the technical language through questioning leads to talk and writing responses from the students that more closely approximates the language in the focus text, which is the language that we've specifically chosen to be scientifically accurate um, and the language that we are wanting the students to be using specifically. Another strategy uh, is what we call look back, look forward. And this is uh, in each lesson, uh, reflecting on previous content, the look back, before continuing on to the next part of the teaching and learning sequence, the look forward where this pedagogical strategy enables students to place or contextualise the lesson in the broader context of the work. Um, it provides the students the opportunities to recall key language and concepts from previous lessons before moving on to the new learning. This is done in a variety of ways. Um, through our questioning, as I've just mentioned, where we revisit um, things from previous lessons such as diagrams, images, notes that we've taken, re-watching carefully selected video clips, sometimes muted with teacher uh, explanation, sometimes with the video uh, explanation or, or um, uh, just the commentary from the video itself, um, asking students to explain previous learning activities or demonstrations and asking them to explain the purpose of the previous activities in the context of the unit of work. There's many ways to do the look back. Sometimes it's very short, sometimes it's a little bit more detailed depending on what the, the next part of the, um, or the look forward, look forward is. The next one is probably one of the most crucial aspects of this pedagogy, which is about the intentional mapping of the language to the activity. Because this guides your work and as Louise mentioned about the focus text being almost your unit plan and, and your, it, is, it is your focus throughout the unit, this guides your work through the lessons with your activities, your demonstrations, everything that you do. So your language selections are, are purposefully and are, are done purposefully and specifically to meet the need of connecting the learning activity to the focus text or the language in the focus text. Throughout the activity, you will deliberately use the language that you want or that you've chosen for your focus text and you'll use it consistently and multiple times. You will often have the student say the language as well and you'll have them say it in the way that you have said it and the way that you have written it multiple times. This is important, the consistency of using it, because uh, when you are wanting, when you're writing the focus text or when you're wanting the students to use it, you want them to use the language in exactly the way that you do. So it's important because this consistency of your use of the language during the unit makes 
the connection for the students between the learning activity yes. and the focus text or the language in the, in the focus text. Yes. And that leads to the final strategy that I'm going to talk about. And that, similar to the mapping of the language, is about the oral language and our use of visuals and note taking and how that leads to our joint construction of paragraphs in the focus text. So we create our focus text with students gradually after each learning activity and not at the end of the unit. Each learning or each learning activity or lesson involves, like I just mentioned, the specific use of some oral language or, or language coming from the learning activity or visuals or demonstrations, whatever it is. And that leads to the note taking and then the joint construction of a particular paragraph for our focus text. So during our lesson, we will, for example, be watching a video clip or looking at some images. And we will be hearing or using particular language that we want to eventually use in the focus text. We will then uh, do some note taking. Now, depending on your class, you can do it, and we've done it in a couple of different ways. We've done the note taking for the students where we've just written the notes and had the students watch us. We've also had the students do the notes in their books or, or in a way while we've done them as well. So you can do, you can use either way. But the students will, um, will see that you are taking particular key language that's important scientific language from the learning activity, the visual, the video um, from, from that activity. And you will then use those notes to create a, a paragraph and you'll jointly construct that at the end of the learning activity. And that paragraph will summarise the learning from that particular uh, lesson. So if we just think about the example that I gave about the power up, power down with the language that we were using there. So the solar radiation bouncing off leading to the wanting them to use the um, term reflected or reflection. So in our focus text, we had a sentence that read, solar radiation reaches the Earth's atmosphere. Some of this is reflected back into space. So the purpose there was to help them understand the term reflected because we specifically wanted to use that in our focus text. Now the value of doing this joint construction at the end of the, the lesson rather than at the end of the unit, a couple of points is students get to see you doing the note taking. They get to see you picking out from the learning activity, the visual, the video, whatever it be, the key language they get to see you creating a scientifically accurate and well-written paragraph. And while you're jointly constructing it, they get to see you as the expert talking aloud the decisions you make as a writer. Yeah. And that's really important mm -hmm. to help them when they are doing their own writing at the end of the unit when I w we would expect them to be doing their own piece of writing or doing their own oral discussion, but in this, in this particular sense talking about writing, that they are making decisions about how they use the language specifically. So constructing the paragraph with them is really important and they get to hear you as the expert talking about the decisions you make as a writer using the specific language and specific terminology that you've got in your notes. Final last point, it also allows you at the point of need to talk about particular grammar that you can use in, in the paragraph. Yeah, because the grammar explains the meaning yeah, as much as the Abs individual words. Absolutely. Well, that's a rigorous approach. Louise, what were the outcomes for students and you know, what were your insights and how has it changed your practice? Yeah, thanks, Julie. I think it, this links really well with what Michael was saying, because one of the key things that we found was that students um, coming into the learning did not know how to take notes. And this, we found this across all learning areas. And it was that idea of, 
I really like how a primary source has been written, it's, it's written really well, and I can't write that well, so I'm just gonna copy and paste that. And we talked a lot with students around um, simply copying someone isn't showing your understanding. So even though the unit of work, we, we would start with the talking and they would talk back. Eventually they transferred that almost, that language and that script into their own version to explain images, diagrams, animations, to, to show that they did have that understanding. And I guess it's about transferring that skill set, not just within science across other areas. So looking at um, a rich text that they found, being able to find key technical terms, being able to keep phrases together so that they're not changing the meaning behind it, mm -hmm. but then setting aside that original source and using that in their own writing so that they can show that they do understand in an accurate way and and that's that's great for all learning areas but particularly for science so that was that was a big one the crucial element of note taking i think secondly was around the power of language and and the positive affect so um, michael talked a lot about um, keeping them engaged and i think it's around maintaining the integrity of your teaching and, and not allowing in, an incorrect answer just to float out there and other students to think that that's the understanding but to encourage students to give things a go because the way that we can help ourselves is by having a go and understanding that part of your language was great or the contribution and the engagement was good, but oh, I now know that that part wasn't quite accurate and I've heard now the accurate response and I can, I can join that with my understanding. So that's really key. If we only wanna hear the correct answers, then we're only validating students that almost had most of that learning coming into the unit as sure. it was. Yep. Um, I guess, when you initially are doing that and, and you are having these long long talking terms and you're using a lot of technical language, you know, the negative voice in the back of your head is, is wondering, are they really getting it? They're doing a lot of listening. Um, but the, the positive outcomes that were evident in their writing and in their oral expressions, and also we had subsequent um, units where students were connecting real live events they'd seen, and they were still able to use that technical language. And I think that you can't underestimate the power of that, that repetition and that constant use, especially when it's something that's really unfamiliar. If you only say it once yourself, as we all know as adults, we're less likely to remember it. The more we are practicing and rehearsing, the more it becomes something that we understand and then we can then use our own version of the language to show understanding outside of the unit. And we've had students in this previous research that, that you mentioned, years later coming back and saying, oh, we were doing Adams in year nine and I remembered five years, three years ago in year five and six, how we did that. There aren't other ways that we've been teaching. We haven't had that feedback from students that they still really understood it to such a deep level. They're recalling it three years later and using it in context. So um, we were really fortunate that um, after we did the greenhouse effect, we did lunar eclipses and Michael led that learning and we happened to have a lunar eclipse and the amount of emails we had from students, you know, in the evenings, on the weekends, never in a topic had we done, had we had that level of engagement. And even students saying the images were too big, so I've changed their files and they were out there looking at the eclipse, they were talking about the direct alignment, they were using the language that we'd really carefully yeah. planned and mapped yeah. and they were so excited. And then they brought their parents and their families into that engagement of that scientific discourse. And I guess that's that's the big takeaway. It does seem like a lot of work and it is a challenge. And sometimes you get a little bit of pushback from students because it is really challenging. But at the end of it, it's, it's really worth it to see the depth of their understanding and how they can apply that. Michael, what's happened since your involvement in this research? What opportunities are you offering for students around science? Mm, so I guess that's sort of about so where to where to from here. Yeah, what, are, what, yeah. what does that where, where where are we going? What does it do for us? So um, for us, th this pedagogy is is something that we continue continue with, and we will continue to refine our practice with it. And and we think that it serves our students really well. Yeah. Um, something else that we want to do is is to help other teachers. Um, build their capacity to use focused texts yes, at, school. at the school. Yeah, absolutely, and and with our, our, our other schools as well, if they're happy to. We have we have had a, opportunity to um, work with other teachers at some surrounding schools and um, uh, do some demonstrations and have some workshops with them. Um, and I would be happy to again, um, but again because we we've seen the results and seen the way that it um, impacts on yeah. on student learning. Um, 
the way that it um, invites students to engage in lessons, we want to continue doing that. As Louise was just talking about the way that it invites students into the scientific discourse, yes, we want it within our science lessons and in, in, in the lessons where you know, we are expecting them to be engaged, but we also want them to be doing it outside of just that, yeah. just, just, the, just the lesson here at school. So when they're at home and they've got their you know, screen time, we want them to be searching YouTube for science phenomena, going in and, and doing some of their own learning around that. Um, here at school, we have a climate change group. Um, over the course of three years, it's doubled in size each, each year. Um, and so you know, we're hoping that some of this science teaching has been part of that. Yeah that it has developed the interest in, in that. And so, um, you know, our, our big aim is we want students to think like scientists, to wonder like scientists, to observe like scientists, to act like scientists. And um, we want them to study science for at, at high school yeah. and at university. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Louise mentioned earlier in the video was about when we're creating the focus text was about you know, seeking out reputable sources and using using those. We want students to be able to identify scientific misinformation, yeah, and we want them to be able to seek reputable sources for their information as well. And we hope that through giving them this ability to use the language for scientific discourse and be part of that community, that they are able to to do that, to identify misinformation and and to to challenge misinformation when it is presented, and very and that's, important. That's that's one of the big big picture things that we hope this this work does. Mm. So thank you both for being brave and engaging with the researchers from Peter and for um, putting your practice on the line and continuing to refine and to think about using evidence to change your practice and improve outcomes for kids. Thank you. Thank you very much.